Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Sean Hinton, welcome to the Baha'i Blogcast. So nice to see you. So nice to hear you. Thanks for being on the show. Is this a show? I guess it's a show. Welcome to the show. What a pleasure to be on the show. There's so much I want to ask you. There's so much I want to dig into. But I want to say that in my life as a Baha'i, really for the last 20 years, and and when I grew up a Baha'i as a teenager... Um, One of the greatest Baha'i stories, maybe the single greatest Baha'i story I've ever heard in my life, was you telling the story about becoming a knight of Baha'u'llah and your journeys and your travails in Mongolia. And it is, I know you've told it a thousand times, and my deepest apologies, but the story is extraordinary. You tell it so well, I really wanted to share that with our listeners. Before we get into any of the biography or personal story or what you're working on or anything like that, let's cut to the chase. How did you become a Knight of Baha'u'llah? So I hope your show is a long show because I don't I don't know if I do a short version of this, but I'll do my very best. No. You know what? Let's do the long version. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. Let's do the longest possible version. <laughs> well, you know, I was... I was a long-bearded, long-haired music student in London. Uh, I had grown up in Australia. I'd come to London to to, to the big city to uh, to to study music, and I was with my Baha'i friends in the summer uh, that year of uh, of of eighty seven, and. In the course of that summer, we, with, with one particular very dear Baha'i friend, Adam Robarts and I, we conceived of this idea of, of undertaking a pilgrimage, but of flying to Istanbul and of following Baha'u'llah's route of exile through, uh, through Turkey. Um, and we, we did that. We went as close as we could. We followed the, the places, the route, the roads, the, the mosques that Baha'u'llah visited during How his exile. How old were you at exile. this point? So I was 21. I turned 21 in Istanbul. And uh, Adam and his father, uh, who came to sort of send us off on our way, uh, we had dinner. Um, We went to Asia for dinner across the bridge and had dinner together at the Hilton Hotel uh, on the Asian side of Istanbul for my 21st birthday. And and we set off. And it was an extraordinary journey. It was was wonderful. It felt like, uh, like a new thing in those days. Uh, we didn't know many other of our peers who had had the chance to visit those places and indeed to spend four or five days as we did at the house of Baha'u'llah in Edirne. The local Baha'is gave us the key. We we walked on the cobblestones that Baha'u'llah must have walked on to the mosque. I mean, it was just an extraordinary, wonderful experience. And 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 as we progressed through Turkey, down the coast to Izmir, to Gelibolu, and then we, we went by boat... Um, across the Mediterranean uh, and sailed into Haifa at dawn on this uh, on this sort of little boat. Along the way, we start we 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 had an argument, as good Baha'is on pilgrimages do. And we talked about that extraordinary period from 1953, the Ten Year Crusade, when Shoghi Effendi had issued this challenge to this then nascent community that was centered only in a few cities in the world, in a few major, you know, in a few countries and, and main sit, major cities in the world, really. And he issued this extraordinary challenge, complete with a map and, a, and, a, and, and you know, lists and everything to these communities to, to dissipate, to spread, to, to go to the corners of the earth, to places that people hadn't even heard of, to these territories and um, you know, islands and uh, and to fulfill these goals to m- realize Baha'u'llah's vision of the Baha'i community as a truly global faith, as a faith for, for, for all people. Mm-hmm. 
And he wrote、mm-hmm. these extraordinary letters about what that should be like and who the people that they would go to were. And it was a soul stirring call. And of course, as, as we know, as you know, so many extraordinary people、uh, took that challenge and, and went without knowing really even where or how they were going to get there, they went. And we talked about that because indeed,、uh, Adam's father and grandparents were Knights of Baha'u'llah. And so, In, in the course of that conversation, I was convinced that that moment had passed, that all of those goals from that period, 1953, had been filled. And Adam was kind of sure that perhaps some of them weren't, that, that perhaps the period of, of the Cold War、uh, and the extraordinary changes that had, had happened across Eastern Europe in that period had meant that some of those goals of the Guardian were still unfilled. And we had an opportunity while on pilgrimage to settle the bet, as it were.、Uh, and over dinner with、um, one of the members of the House of Justice, Mr. Semple, we asked him the question. We said, Well, who's right, Adam or Sean? And what's the story with, the, with these goals from, from, the, from the Guardian's 10 year crusade? And Mr. Semple said, with a, with a twinkle in his eye, and I will never forget the table and the setting and the people and, and seeing him at the other end of the table, sort of. Looking at me and saying, Well, there are two places left Mongolia and the Sakhalin Islands. And you know what, Sean? You should go to Mongolia and study the music. And he got a laugh. It was a great line. And, and everyone, at the, what a joker, Mr. Semple. How's a justice member going to? Sean's not going to go to Mongolia. He, you know, could hardly take the bus, to, bus home. You know, I mean, there was just no way that that, that, that was going to happen. It was a. It was a, a wonderful, light hearted moment. But of course, that seed went in, and I sat there at the table and thought to myself, well, what if I did? Where, where would you, how would you? I just sort of mulled it around in my head. I, I kept thinking about it. One of the youth serving in the World Center heard about this story and came to me, gave me this little packet as I was leaving Haifa to,、uh, to, to, to go back to London. And in this packet was a, was a series of folded pages that had come out of a dot matrix printer and in the old、mm-hmm. days. And he had gone to the computer at the Baha'i World Center, because there was one then. And he had gone to <laughs> the computer and he'd typed in a search of all the references in the Baha'i writings to the word Mongolia. And he'd printed them out laboriously on these sort of folded sheets of computer paper. And there it was. There were these references, mostly from The Guardian.、Uh, when The Guardian called on the pioneers to, to go to these far flung parts of the world, and, and I had goosebumps as I took off from Tel Aviv reading these passages and thinking, wow, what would that be like? What would it be like if you actually went? And I got back to London and I, I looked up in.、Um, I have to explain this. I think your fan base,、uh, Rain, is, is, is a, a, a younger demographic who, who may not recall a time before the internet.、Um, in the old days, they used to take the internet and they used to print it out in a book, and it was called the White Pages, right? It was called the phone directory. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of like the Like the internet printed also, out. Also, and you remember, a- you remember encyclopedias? Yes. It was that a- was like a printed version of Wikipedia. A printed. A printed version of Wikipedia. Well, this was a printed version of sort of, you know, the address book of, of, of London. And I looked up and there was a Mongolian embassy in London. And so I got back, and actually, Adam and I were flatmates at Cambridge,、um, in Cambridge. Now, I wasn't a student at Cambridge at the time, I was finishing my studies in London. Adam was at, at Cambridge,、um, and the two of us shared a house in, in, in Cambridge. And I dialed the Mongolian embassy. I thought, I'm on a mission. Mr. Semple's told me I should go. Why am I going to find out? And I called the Mongolian embassy and nobody answered. And I called them again. I was quite persistent and nobody answered. And I called them again and I called them again and nobody answered. And I forgot about it. I, I moved on, life moved on. I was busy. I was in my final year of university. I was, you know, doing this. And I have to say,、uh, Rain, I, I completely、uh, forgot about that idea, about that sort of dinner, about what Mr. Semple had said. 
And about six months later, uh, I remember, again, I remember this so clearly, sitting at my desk in, my, in, in our house in Cambridge, looking at some things. It was Friday afternoon. It was five o'clock. And I remember coming across this little piece of red paper, a scrap of paper on which I'd written um, the telephone number of the Mongolian embassy. And I thought, oh, yeah, there was that Mongolia thing. And so I dialed the phone. I dialed the number without thinking, without a plan. And, of course, it answered on the first ring. And I didn't know what I was going to say. I had no plan. And so I, I, I said, well, and all I could remember was what Mr. Semple had said to me. And so I said, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to Mongolia to study the music. And he said, OK, great, fine. And, let, you know, this is the Mongolian embassy. And I said, well, the now, only thing I could think little, of. Can you give us a little background here? Why had Mongolia not previously been opened up, right? It had to do with its communist uh, origins, Yes. So Mongolia is a huge landlocked country sitting in between China and Russia. It was the second country after the Soviet Union to have a socialist revolution, 1921, and had been a firm part of the Soviet bloc since then, but since the 1950s had had no connection at all from China. They had very much taken the side of the Soviet Union. And so from about the period that the Guardian, um, you know, made the call for the Knights of Baha'u'llah, Mongolia had been very, very much between the Iron Curtain and in fact had sat almost impenetrable between those two countries where Russia used it as a base for, 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 for troops to sit along the Chinese border um, but didn't really want anybody going in and out. It was never part of the Soviet Union. It was always formally independent, but it was this you know, sort of island in the middle of, of uh, uh, you know, of, of the continent, three times the size of France, approximately the same size, actually, as, as Iran, a huge territory, and uh, with just two million people. And so this tiny population spread out in this incredible landscape, the coldest capital in the world, minus 40 degrees in, in, in winter, in both Fahrenheit and Celsius, by the way. Wow. Fun fact. Mm. And um, this, this extraordinary country that was really, really isolated. And what I didn't know then when I made that phone call to the Mongolian embassy was that they gave, that, that, that Mongolia allowed a handful of people, six, seven foreigners each year, uh, the opportunity to get a visa to go and live in the country uh, and work in the country. There would be visitors who would come through on the train for a few days, but to actually live there, there was a, literally a handful of Westerners who, who had the opportunity each year to go in. So I blathered my way through with this chap on the embassy, and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to Mongolia to study the music, and, and, and I need a scholarship. Do you have any money? And he said, no, we don't have a scholarship. We're the Mongolian embassy. We, we, we give visas, and we're not, we don't give any of those out. So, you know, forget about it. Um, but he said, you know, there's an organization called the British Council, which is the sort of British government's cultural exchange, you know, sort of uh, organization. And they might be able to help you. So Friday afternoon, 5.30, I looked up in the phone book again and I called this British Council number. And, I, and, and somehow, 5.30 <laughs> on a Friday afternoon, I get through to the Mongolian department and I do my same spiel. I'm going to Mongolia to study the music. Wow guy says, it's amazing you should call. Because actually, we have one scholarship, and the scholarship closes, the application closes on Wednesday. So, you know, what you're studying, music, sounds kind of interesting, sounds fairly harmless. You know, we have a lot of people that want to study politics and things, very sensitive, we can't send them. You have to know that this is a postgraduate scholarship, you have to be enrolled in postgraduate, is that, is that, well, I said, yes, I'm, I'm in Cambridge. Now, I was living in a city called Cambridge. I wasn't actually enrolled at Cambridge University. There was a technical <laughs> detail that maybe I had left out in that first call. But I figured I'd get to that later. So there I was on a Friday night with a weekend and a couple of days to, to make an application to go to a country I couldn't place on the map to do something I didn't know anything about. So lots of prayers ensued. Adam and I sat there and said, oh, my God, that, phone, that conversation at dinner, that, what, what, what do we do? So my first point of call was to go to the library at Cambridge and to, to try and find a record of Mongolian music. And I found one. And for the younger listeners mm. here, that's uh, 
yeah, you know what vinyl looks like. It's still a thing. Well, this was mm -hmm. a vinyl uh, record of Mongolian music, and it was beautiful, beautiful, haunting music. Maybe, maybe when you put this all together, we can get a recording of some Mongolian music and uh, and share it with uh, with with your listeners because it's it's beautiful, haunting, captivating music. But there was something about this record that was familiar the name of the of the professor of ethnomusicology who had recorded this somehow rang a bell with me and i i couldn't figure out where i called my parents in australia and i said so gene jenkins why do i know the name gene jenkins and my mother said why are you asking i said no, don't worry it's a story she said well you've heard us talk about her because when you were two years old, we used to rent the basement apartment from Jean Jenkins, and she would hold you up and show you the Mongolian violins and the African drums and the musical instruments she'd brought back oh from around gosh. the world. That's amazing. So, you know, that little feeling in the prickle in the back of your neck when you think, well, okay, that's, that's strange. And then my next point of call was to go to the library. I researched about, you know, Mongolia. What else could I find out? And I, I started, you know, researching and writing. And then I thought, well, I better see if, Mongo if, if Cambridge University has any experts on Mongolia. So I, I called up the Oriental Studies Department. They said, no, we don't have anyone. No, no, no. She said, no, you have to call the Mongolian Studies Unit. I said, you know, there's no such thing as a Mongolian. Study. She said, yes, the only one in the world. Right here oh in Cambridge. Goodness. Yeah, you should call mm. them. They're, they're, they're really good at what they do. So I called them up. And I don't think the phone rings very often at the Mongolian Studies Unit of Cambridge University, to be <laughs> honest. They were kind of excited. You know, they answered. And um, I said, uh, I'm going to Mongolia to study the music. Wow. They were excited to hear that. You know, they, they said, now, would you like to study Mongolian language? And I said, well... Uh, yeah, I guess. And they said, well, because it's amazing you should call. Just now, just two weeks ago for the first time, we have a professor of Mongolian language who's, who's arrived, who's been allowed to come to Cambridge for the first time, and he's ready to give lessons. You can have free classes. He could come to your home. I mean, you know, they were so excited about this. <laughs> and once again, you know, wow, they were so excited this was happening. You know, there was this sort of sense of the doors opening. So I went on and I, I wrote this proposal and then I called the music faculty and, and I asked if there was a professor of the study of ethnomusicology, the study of music in society. It's like music and anthropology, which was really what this discipline was called and not something I knew anything about. And, and I got through and I said, look, I wondered whether I could come and show you uh, this proposal I've written. I'm going to apply for this scholarship and I really want to get this scholarship and I and I, I want I'd, I'd appreciate it if you could have a look at it and she said fine bring it over so I, I I went over and I I showed it to her and she read it and she said you know this is this is very good this is really this is really interesting stuff she said have you but you know this scholarship I know these scholarships and this is a postgraduate scholarship and I said yeah well I'm gonna figure that out I'm, I'm still an undergraduate but I'll 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 figure that out next week and she said, yeah, but have you thought about coming to Cambridge? And I said, well, yeah, I have, but, you know, I, I'm a classical music student. I've been, you know, training as a conductor and, you know, Cambridge is not interested in me. I've already asked. She said, no, well, it's amazing you should be calling, right? Amazing you should be asking right now because just a few, uh, just, just a few months ago, we created a new master's program designed for someone like you, who's got field experience. So if you can get this scholarship, we'd love to have you. And I said, no, but I don't have the qualifications because, you know, blah, blah, blah. She said, come with me. We went down the corridor. She knocked on the door of the, of the academic faculty secretary. She said, can we admit a guy who we want to have if he's got the right kind of, and he's going to Mongolia to study the music? He said, yeah, it's up to you. You're the professor. You can choose. She said, right, welcome to Cambridge University. That was my application for graduate school. <laughs> like I had to write my name and address and that sort of subject of Mongolia and that, that was it. You know, she said, you get the scholarship, you have a place at Cambridge. So I went back, I sent off this application and now it was getting serious. And now, you know, as, as Baha'is, Rain, we're, we're supposed to be confident. We're not supposed to be afraid. We're supposed to be confident. We're supposed to rely on 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 all the sorts of assistance that comes when we when we feel that we're acting in 
in alignment with our values when we're we're trying to serve uh, you know the cause when we're trying to be of service to humanity that we should be confident that there'll be divine assistance and that we'll be able to accomplish great things but I was nervous I got to tell you I mean, I'm not very good at all mm-hmm. that I was like I went into that interview and I was really worried what are they going to say am I going to mess this up and and they asked me a series of questions. Well, listen, young man, they said, the first question is, this is a very good proposal. We don't have any questions about your proposal. We really like it. But we have a couple of practical questions. First question is, this is a postgraduate scholarship. You're an undergraduate. I said, yeah, well, I'm actually offer from Cambridge University. Wow, Cambridge University, very good. Oh. <laughs> the second problem is, you know, we send people to Mongolia. Your application says you want to go for nine months, but you don't speak any Mongolian and people in Mongolia don't speak any English. One of the things you don't you need to know about Mongolia is because of that isolation and that connection to the Soviet mm. Union, mm. they really banned the study of English through those years. And so every school in the country taught Russian, but really only one group of students at the university were allowed to to learn uh, English. And so they said, you know, we're going to send you to Mongolia, you're going to study the music, and yet you don't speak a word of the language. Mm. How are you going to do the study? I said, well, you know, actually, I've been taking classes with Professor Damden at, uh, at, uh, at, at Cambridge University. They were like, speaks Mongolian. That's amazing. <laughs> no, again, I may not have told them quite how many lessons I'd had. But, you know, these were details, it seemed to me, that they didn't need to worry about too much. So We'll do another, you know, we'll do another podcast on truthfulness. Yes, I think I think of all virtues. As a, I think maybe just, I should uh, I should subscribe to your podcast in order to study that with you. <laughs> yes, I think that's right. And then you know they said, look, we're 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 we had they had a series of these extraordinary questions, and every single one I had these kind of answers for. And finally, they said, listen, we're worried that you uh, you're going to go to this country now. As I said, this is a this is a, a remote country the temperature is very extreme and they said we've sent one or two british scholars before and they they just couldn't manage in the in the temperature and the conditions it's it's very simple very basic um at that time and i grew up in australia i may have seen snow once before at that age but really not very much i mean i'm not really Mm -hmm. good in the cold Mm -hmm. but it just i didn't want to spoil a good thing i didn't want to spoil a good story so Luckily, I had just a few months before I had visited Finland to visit the Baha'i community in Finland. And they put me on a nice warm train and I'd gone up to visit the Baha'is in a little town called Rovaniemi, which was just over the Arctic Circle. So I said, well, you know, I was I'm not worried by the cold. I was traveling in Finland above the Arctic Circle just this just this Christmas. They were so they were like, (laughs) oh, my God, this guy's an explorer. (laughs) You know, I was just I had so. I left that room and, and a few hours later they called to say congratulations that I had been given this scholarship and that, as I say, thereby giving me the opportunity to go to Mongolia and to get a, a visa that was one of only a handful that were given mm. to, to, to foreigners in the, in the world, to Westerners, I should say, anywhere in the world to visit Mongolia in that year. And so some months later... Uh, I had the opportunity to go on pilgrimage uh, for, uh, uh, you know, I had applied many years before. My date came up and it turned out that the date for pilgrimage was just before I was due to leave for Mongolia. And so Mm. I visited uh, the Holy Land. Uh, I got an invitation to tea with Ruhir Hanum, who, uh, as your listeners know, is the um, widow of of Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And... She was an extraordinary traveler and a presence and a, and a writer and author and just an extraordinary human being um, and really a person of great significance as, a, as you know, a living member of the extended holy family um, for Baha'is. And I got an invitation to tea at, at the house of Abdul Baha, at the master's house with Ruhir Khanum. And, and I went along and there were a few other people there and she greeted each of them and she said, well, it's wonderful to see you, Mr. So-and-so. You're here because you were a knight of Baha'u'llah to this territory and you're here because you had this wonderful service. And Then she got to me and she said, well, you're here because of something we hope you're going to do. You better go, young man. 
And so <laughs> she, I was like, oh, my Lord, you know, I was ready to go. And, and sure enough, a week later, I got back to the UK and I got on a train from London um, and I took the train across Europe through Berlin, through Moscow, right across on the Trans-Siberian, all the way down to Mongolia. And in December, December the 28th, uh, 1988, I arrived in, in Mongolia. And in do, so doing, um, had the privilege of becoming the first Baha'i to, to, to live in that country. And that's the story of how I got to Mongolia. Now, of course, the real story is what happens next, right? <laughs> there's, there's, I know there's more aspects to this story. I remember. Keep going. Well, it was extraordinary to be there. And, and, and I, I want to sort of give you a sense of quite how of quite how isolated it was, you know. I mean, I was, I was twenty-two. Um, I had, you know, lived away from home for a few years, but I had always grown up in a wonderful Baha'i community with, um, you know, with with and in a community and in a family, and and uh, had lived and, and and enjoyed that community all my life. And now I was living in a foreign student hostel, in a sort of Soviet. Um, style foreign student hospital hostel rather mm. where a handful of bulgarian uh russian one or two vietnamese laotian cambodian students all of those students from this sort of extended sort of community of communist and socialist countries were living and then you know there was me and uh how was your mongolian was at this point so you know not great, right? I could, I had a handful of words. I was saying hello. And, and actually I had been really, you know, I'd been really boning up on my, on the trip over and trying to sort of get those lessons in. But, you know, I was not functional at all. And so all of us, you know, I had sort of two or three hours of language classes a day. That was what they gave me because they said, you have to learn the language before you can do any of your, your, your academic studies on, on the music. And so that was what I did all day was just learn the language, but it was very rudimentary. And I remember a, a moment just a few weeks after I arrived when I realized that it was the 19-day feast. And I realized that this was, I was all on my own. I didn't know what I was going to do. I wanted to sort of celebrate this somehow. And so I, I, I started preparing for this event. And I, I remember thinking, well, I, I need to, you know, need to get some something special, you know, and they could sort of share it with some of the students and the, and the friends. And listen, how rudimentary it was. I went to the store. I went to the department store in, the, in, in, in Ulaanbaatar in the city. Um, and that month they were only selling forks. They didn't have knives, <laughs> right? Because the factory in, in Siberia that made knives and forks only had made forks that month or whatever it was. And yeah. we would go to the store and there, was, there would be meat but no vegetables or there would be potatoes but nothing else you know it was very very simple in those days and so i had my Way little bowl back in 1989 oh yes back in the <laughs> last century um and on my way back to the students hostel i saw a, a crowd of people gathered outside what must have been a little store in in one of the buildings and when you saw a line of people lining up for something you knew there was something to buy, so you went and joined the line. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. but you figured it was worth it was worth having. So I lined up, I queued up with them, and I was trying to see what it was people had, and you know, and and then I saw someone carrying apples, and I was so excited. I was like, apples? What are the chances? So apples? <laughs> I'm going to have apples for this 19 day feast that I'm going to celebrate mm -hmm. all on my own. I'm going to be able to share apples with the students at the hostel, and that's going to be my, you know, that's going to be my contribution to this sort of to this day this is something that was really important to me so I stood in line I stood in line it was snowing and I was getting ready what was I going to say you know I was getting ready and in Mongolia there are two lines in many parts of that part of the world in those days you would queue to give them money and then you would take your little ticket and then you would queue up to 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 to, to get the produce and so I I queued up and I I got finally I got there to the front of the line and then of course they'd see me and they'd see this white face and the only people that looked like me that were in Mongolia were Russians 
and they would speak Russian. So now not only do I not speak enough Mongolian, I speak no Russian and they're kind of shouting at me in Russian and I don't know what's going on and I'm forgetting all my Mongolian and they stare ah, and then I, I come out with the, the one number I can think of and I say that number. And they say, they look at me and they's like, because I figured that was the right number of apples. So they, they look at me and they really, they're, coming, they're talking to each other. Okay. So they take my money and they give me the ticket and I go and I get, and they start loading me up, not with eight apples, but with eight kilos of apples. Now, eight kilograms of apples is a lot of apples. <laughs> and in a store where they don't give you, you know, a paper sack to carry them in, I didn't have anything. I was putting them in my backpack. I was stuffing them into my, you know, into my jacket. I, they were down my sleeves. You know, I, I walked home like the Michelin <laughs> man, you know, with with eight kilos of apples that I didn't know what to do with, but I'd paid for and I wasn't going to give away. You know, I wasn't going to wasn't going to leave there. And I went back to my my student hostel and I cut these apples up with a fork and I shared them with the students and I commemorated this. Uh, this sort of 19 day feast and I remember it because the, the the electricity went out that evening and I sat in it by candlelight and realized that for thousands of miles around me there were no Baha'is and yet I was connected to this global Baha'i community that at that moment in other parts of Asia and other parts of the world and an hour later and an hour later people were observing this practice of the 19 day feast and that there was this kind of wave of united action taking place mm. across the world mm. in this community and and actually though I was sort of physically distant I had this very overpowering sense of connectedness to mm. the, the 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 global Baha'i community and to my Baha'i family as it were, around the world. And that really sustained me through, uh, you know, through, through many months uh, in that first year of, uh, of being isolated in Mongolia. Now, let me ask you, um, how were your studies going? What was that like? And also, you were, I assume, also doing some kind of feeble attempts at teaching the Baha'i faith or bringing it up in conversation or hey, do you want to say a prayer to people that had been raised in communist societies and probably were, you know, they were prob there probably wasn't a theist within thousands of miles. So uh, what was that like? Yeah, so before I went, I asked the Universal House of Justice for some guidance and, uh, as to, you know, how one should, what was appropriate in this, in a society where the practice of religion was, you know, was 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 seriously constrained. Let's say, um, I had heard that uh, a, a tourist had been visiting Mongolia on the train and had arrived and had had two Bibles with him at that uh, when he had entered, and that he had been, as it were, arrested and turned away at the border, and the Bibles had been confiscated. So, you know, we knew that that this was a highly sensitive moment, and that I wasn't to travel into Mongolia with you know, more than a single book, a single volume of Baha'i prayers and readings that I would use for my own purpose. But that really, I had to be, to give the greatest of respect to those laws and to that practice in that country. And I wasn't in any way going to Mongolia uh, by subterfuge uh, or to to sort of undermine any of those practices. I also felt very deeply the responsibility that as the first Baha'i to be living in Mongolia, how I behaved my how I how I carried myself, how I behaved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would reflect somehow on on some of the early perceptions of the Baha'i faith, perhaps that that Mongolians and Mongolia would would have. And so I felt that responsibility very greatly. I did have, in, in uh, April, May of that year, uh, a visit um, from Rihir Khanum, actually, uh, who came to Mongolia. She was traveling in China uh, she was that passing year through. at that time. And okay. well, <laughs> you couldn't pass through just, Mongolia, just but you, popping, she was popping down the she was in the region. Railroad and, That's right. Yeah. Well, she was in China. She'd been in Hong Kong and China and in Asia. 
and uh, you know she was um, you know she was not she was an el elderly then um, and uh, in in her I think late seventies at the time and she uh, I got a message from my father who passed a message to me saying. You know, Mrs. Rabani is coming to visit, and I had to arrange sort of invitations for her. And she came as as traveling, uh, as it were, personally. You know, um, not on official business of the Baha'i community. And she came with a few, uh, uh, with a few colleagues and and friends. And so, because in those days there was only one flight a week from Beijing to Ulaanbaatar, she. Either she had no choice but to come and stay for seven days. That was the only option, and mm. uh, so I had this great privilege of of spending a week with her, um, and walking around the city because we didn't have a car. We couldn't rent a car. There were very few private cars, and we took buses. Mm. I'd maybe you know to have taken a a public bus with Ruhir Khanum around Mongolia. But I observed visiting how the sites like the Museum of Falcon. We went to museums. We went to the museum. Actually, the Dinosaur Museum. Thank you, Rain. If you'd done your research for this interview, <laughs> you would know that it's not the Falconry Museum. It's the uh, Dinosaur Museum that is the okay. great attraction in Mongolia. But um, we did. We went to to museums and we went to you know the monastery and we visited the sort of historical sites as any tourist would. And she was an extraordinary guest and curious about every aspect of Mongolian culture and loved eating the fatty mutton uh, that the Mongolians eat and, and, uh, and, and loved so much and just had this extraordinary enthusiasm and, and curiosity for everything around her. But when it came to meeting those Mongolian people that I was able to introduce and I was able to connect her to and that we met along the way, she observed an extraordinary tact and discretion um, and answered questions truthfully and sincerely, but without putting any burden on that person of telling them about the Baha'i faith or, you mm. know, in, in any way that would, that would put them in any difficult position. And she said to me in that first visit that, you know, when we draw breath, to speak about our faith, to speak about this message, even if we can't give utterance to that thought, the act of drawing breath, the intention of speaking, is enough to draw on the powers of divine assistance and is enough to have an, an, an effect in the world. You know, the wonderful passage in the writings that talks about the scattering angels, scattering those, those mm -hmm. words abroad when we pray, well, she said, you know, that, that happens even if you can't give utterance to those words because of your condition, because of where you are. And so I sort of held that very closely as I went through that year. Now, I was there to learn, not to teach, but the previous holder of this scholarship, the former, the previous British Council scholar, asked me if I would take on one student who he had been teaching English to. There was a young woman who had been doing conversation classes with him. She was very capable uh, and mm -hmm. an English speaker. And he asked me as a personal favor, and he'd been very helpful to me, if I would take her on as the one and only student that I took on. And I, of course, agreed to do that. And so I would meet with her weekly, and we would have conversation classes where we would read a passage from an English newspaper, and we would talk about world affairs. And as the year progressed, our conversations got more, more substantive. And she would reflect on how I had an orientation to what was happening in the news that seemed to find the positive, the sort of the, 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 the meaning of those stories and of those events taking place in the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. with, an, with, an, with, an, with an optimism. And she was curious about this. She said, how is it that you, that you see these events and you, 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 know, you talk about this sort of rolling up of the old way, but you're talking about this new world order that's emerging and it seems so exciting and so interesting. Anyway, 
one day towards the end of my uh, you know, towards the end of my stay um she came and she was in tears in this in this in this class and she said look you know your optimism is is all very well but my life is truly truly difficult i am presented with so many challenges and burdens and and you know she mm. had terrible she had a degenerative uh, uh eye condition she had very great economic and you know health problems in her family and and you know living in mongolia in those times was difficult just difficult mm. for everyone let alone a mm -hmm. you know a, a a bright independent woman who wanted to sort of develop herself and advance herself and she was overwhelmed clearly overwhelmed by all of these these tests and difficulties and i felt that i had to offer her something and that even though i wasn't doing this as a as an act of what we would call teaching per se sharing with the, something about the bahai faith particularly i felt that having access to one of the bahai prayers one of those passages would would just be a balm to that suffering and would be a, a gift to her and so i said let me let me share something with you that i say when i find myself in mm. times of difficulty mm. and i and i wrote down a short passage from one of the the prayers I didn't attribute it i just put it on a piece of paper and i gave it to her and i said i find this is helpful and she went away now we had weekly classes the knock came on my door the next morning and coming to this hostel was a difficult thing you know because we were so under scrutiny those days that you know at the at the the, the student hostel when when a mongolian would arrive they would have to show their passport they would be registered the you know the sort of the, the mm. secret service mm -hmm. would come and interview them afterwards and say what well, why are you going to the foreigners is it what are you doing i'm learning english right. all right yeah but what what did he say what did you see you know it was really like apples. that in those days yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah all those eight kilos of apples and so it was a big deal for her to come but she came again the next morning she knocked on the door and she said i want another one of those have you got more and so i i wrote out another little passage and i gave it to her and she went away and she came back the next day were you writing it out in english or in mongolian in english because as part of our language conversations she was a yeah. she was a good english speaker mm -hmm. and so then what happened was we took then each week to reading a passage and talking about a passage from the bahai writings unbeknownst to her that that's what it was we talked about these these special words that i was sharing with her and we talked about what they meant and what they might mean and we talked about levels of meaning so instead of talking about the news now we were talking about these passages mm. and we would have these long conversations all by way of a conversation class of an english language class now a couple of weeks before i was due to wind up my year i had an opportunity to leave the city and go and visit the the, the countryside of mongolia i should say that so strict was the security not only was it hard to get into mongolia but it was almost impossible to travel inside mongolia even mongolian citizens had to get an internal passport to travel from one city wow. within the country to the other this is how the soviet system sort of worked and controlled people and so i had been given permission to go for a week's trip to the north of the country and to 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 visit and i was excited about that i was going to go there for a week i was going to come back to the city pack up my things for a week and then get back on the train And so she said to me at our last class before I went she said while you're away I want the book and she pointed to the book from which I had been copying these passages <laughs> Now I hadn't talked to her rain about what the book was what it meant who blah blah, 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 blah. No, was, I hadn't talked about that this was just we were mm. just talking about these about these prayers about these words about what they mean to us as human beings and I thought long and hard about it. I remembered what Rahir Khanum had said about drawing breath, about that sort of assistance, about having confidence, about you know not you know not being afraid even though tens of thousands of enemies are leagued against you. All of that sort of those extraordinary things we read in the writings about the courage that we must have. But I also thought about being wise and not putting her in jeopardy. But I felt as I closed my eyes and asked for you know some help 
um, that I had no choice but to entrust her with that book. And so I gave it to her and I said, look, read it, have a look, enjoy it while I'm gone, but please be careful. And I said, look, this was a, a book of the complete writings of Baha'u'llah. I said, look, don't, don't worry about all these long, complicated books. Try the hidden words. And in my arrogance and wisdom, I thought to myself, you know, I'd better make sure she doesn't read the, the, the Seven Valleys or something really kind of mystical and complicated. I don't understand yeah. it. So how is she mm -hmm. going to manage, mm -hmm. right? Poor little Mongolian girl, I was thinking to myself in my arrogance. And of course, I came back from this trip away and there she was at my, at, the first, at my room when I returned holding this book. And she said, I, I want to talk about this. I think I found a story in here about me. And I, I said, what? And, and of course it was in the Seven Valleys. And it was the story of the lover who searches for his beloved. Mm. And this wonderful, wonderful allegorical story in the Seven Valleys, this beautiful story that we all know so well, that talks about this, 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 this young man, in this case, who is searching for his beloved and is so distraught at having been apart from her and his loneliness from her that he, he abandons all hope he gives up really his 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 sort of sanity a sense of his life and he he goes out on the streets in search for her and he blunders through the city and as he does he's confronted by these watchmen who bar his way and he turns away and goes down another road and is blocked by a watchman. And he calls out and he curses these watchmen who, mm. who are clearly mm. sent to, 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 to destroy him and to harm him and are blocking everything. And these are, this is the source of all of his <clears throat> problems. And, what, you know, he keeps stumbling through the city and eventually he gets to a dead end, to the end of an alley, and he climbs up this wall and it scales this wall. And it was very high and very painful and difficult to scale and he gets to the top of the of the wall and he decides to throw himself over the wall he 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 gives up he he's completely detached even from his own life and he finds himself in a garden and there underneath a tree he sees his beloved he sees what he's been searching for mm. it's the most beautiful passage one of these perfect passages in the bahai writings and she's the reading a story Majnun story that's yes. right the lover is searching for his beloved and 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 he's tell it she's telling me this story and she says i've been searching all my life i've been searching for something all my life and all these difficulties all these tests all these things that i told you about all these things i've been complaining about i've been decrying i've been blaming and yet they were leading me somewhere they were leading me here and I've been climbing this wall. I've been reading and reading and learning and studying. And I feel like I'm at the top of this wall and I don't know what's on the other side. But this is the first thing I've found that is true in my life. Mm. I mm. believe in this. Mm. And so in that extraordinary way, she accepted the, the Baha'i faith. She, 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 you know, began a conversation and she she became the first Baha'i in Mongolia. And I said to her, you know... And this was, the f this was just a couple of weeks before you were leaving. This was just a week or so before I was leaving. And I mm. said to her, you know, you know, one day in the future, people will know about this and there will be people around the world who will be so excited to learn that there is now one Baha'i, you know, in this whole huge country of Mongolia. Mm. And mm. she said, mm. you mean, what, you mean there are Baha'is all around the world? <laughs> <laughs> She wasn't joining because of the, the glossy brochures and the Baha'is everywhere and the temples. and the, You know what I mean? It wasn't any of that. It wasn't any of that that she, she'd fallen in love with these, with these words, with these extraordinary powerful of, these, of, the, of the word. And uh, she was indeed, Oyun, um, at just 22 years old, was, um, was the first Mongolian uh, to become a Baha'i. What's her name? Oyun. Mm. And, mm. and so many... You know, a year or so later, I returned. There was another couple uh, that became Baha'is. A few years, then, then things opened up in Mongolia. It was an extraordinary period of opening, and there were young 
Baha'is who were able to visit from America, from when did Malaysia, from in Singapore. Mid nineties, late nineties. Well, yeah. So late nineties. So I got there in eighty eight, and in eighty nine, if you remember, in in, in at the end of eighty nine, the Berlin Wall fell in in mm -hmm. in um, in Germany, and that triggered this sort of series of of revolutions around and in um, eighteen uh, and in ninety. Mongolia had its own very gentle velvet version of that sort of revolution. They mm -hmm. held an election for the first time. And so it was in 1991 that really things suddenly opened up uh, and people were able to visit and, you know, and so uh, in those years, 1991, 92, more and more Baha'is were able to visit. There were more Mongolians who were free to explore faith for the first time in their lives. There was a great mm -hmm. resurgence of interest after 70 years of communism. There was a huge thirst for learning about religion of all sorts. And that was true of Christianity and, mm -hmm. of course, of a huge resurgence of interest in Buddhism. And over the years, the Baha'i community um, flourished. And I, I believe now the community numbers in the eight or nine thousand uh, in, in, in that country and is a mm. wonderfully mm. Uh, powerful voice in, in, in society and, and a force for good in, in Mongolian society now, which is, uh, mm. which is very special. But it was only later uh, that I discovered that, in fact, by visiting, I knew that by visiting Mongolia, I, was, uh, I had become the first Baha'i, but I didn't know anything about the Night of Baha'u'llah thing. Um, that, that was a letter that the Universal House of Justice wrote to my parents about something while I was uh, in Mongolia, and in that they referred uh, to me in that, in that way. Mm. Mm. Now, do you get, if you get a knight of Baha'u'llah, do you get anything? Do you get like a shield? Do you get a sword? Do you get a crest, a coat of arms? Do you Wouldn't get a plaque? What do you get? you get anything? Or a, or a horse a or a charger or a... I got the... First of all, you can't even... I, I find it a little weird thinking about it. I tend to think about it as if it is somebody else, not me really, um, because it seems sort of slightly strange for me at my age to be associated in any way with those extraordinary figures in the 1950s who, who really went as in that sort of cohort of knights then. And so it's, it's a little strange to imagine that. But let me, let me just jump in on connected. that a little bit and you're, you're being rightfully modest and I appreciate that. And, and yet one of the reasons I find this story so inspiring, Sean, is I've known you for a long time. I don't know you that well, but we've bumped into each other and had some nice conversations and you're, a regular and smart and devoted guy and circumstances propelled you circumstances allowed you to move into this terrain you were obviously being guided by the hand of Baha'u'llah you were this doofus nerdy hippie music student you know being guided on this path and I think that this is why it's so inspiring is like no you're not a saint and you're not this like you know, amazing, like, uh, hero of the faith, you know, you're not Mullah Hussein, you're just this schlubby guy who happened to go on this path and happened yeah. to open up this territory with a pure yeah. heart. And I think that's inspiring because that applies to all of us. Like we yeah. can all do that. We can all be praying. We can be searching for our path. We can be asked to be shown our path. We can take that no matter where it leads us. It doesn't have to bestow upon us any kind of title or honorific or anything like that. We can just, we can do that in our communities and yeah. we can make a difference and we can be a part. And we're all schlubby and we're flawed and we've got crazy hair and beards and we don't know what we're doing half the time and we don't know quite how to teach, but we can keep moving forward. And so it's super important that you not be compared to these titans, uh, you know, to Enoch Alinga or something like that. You, oh. That, but that, but at the same time, the story can be an inspiration to those who listen to follow their spiritual path. Well, thank you for those, uh, you know, those lovely words, and I and I really, I, I really agree with what you say. I think you know one of the extraordinary things that Shoghi Effendi does in his writing is to point out the historical significance of whatever moment it was 
you know, wh- whatever the, the significance of that moment and that time. Mm. And, mm. and I think that that as a practice, it's not true that just the moments that Shoghi Effendi was there are special and important. It's true that if we really understand it, there is something unique and portentous and, and, and extraordinary about each moment we are in. And there mm. are those moments of firsts those moments of breakthrough, those extraordinary possibilities that are available to all of us today. You know, my kids have been the only Baha'i in their school, the first Baha'i in their school, the first Baha'i in their town, the first person to do the first, you know, these firsts are all around us. Not that firsts matter, but the point is that that there is this extraordinariness hmm. to the world and to this time we know that we know that from the baha'i writings and we know that we have that that the things that we accomplish are not our accomplishments because like you say schlubby guy what am i gonna do you know it's not me that that you know i was in an extraordinary time at an extraordinary place and i made a phone call Mm -hmm. and the thing i didn't do was i didn't talk myself out of it thank goodness Hmm. You know, and, and there's a wonderful passage. The House of Justice says fear of failure finds no place hmm. for those who, who for whom teaching is the dominant passion of their life. And I think that's so important because I think so often we talk ourselves out of things. You know, that 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 lovely story, that lovely joke about, you know, guys in the flood and, you know, praise for God to help. And, you know, nothing comes. And then guy comes, knocks on the door, and says, help, I'm going to get you out of there. And doesn't go and then he plays for help and the water's rising and then you know a boat comes says come on we'll get you out of this no i'm waiting god's gonna help me god's gonna help me water rises he's on the roof a helicopter comes help us we're gonna get you out of here he says no 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 i'm gonna be fine god's gonna help me and the water rises and he drowns And, and he goes to the next world and he says god i prayed i believed you what did you you know why you didn't help and he said what do you mean i sent a plane i sent a helicopter i sent a boat i sent a guy <laughs> what you... my point is that that assistance is all around us all the time when we reach out for it and when we take the first step and in my case you know thank goodness i i made that phone call but beyond that i think you know all these other things just just moved in to to make that possible and and mm. i'm very obviously grateful for that but i think that that sort of assistance and those kind of special moments are still all around us. And, and uh, I think we just no matter have where to we recognize are, them we and value them wherever we are. You in, know. in a virgin territory. We, no. Um, now, I have a couple more questions. You didn't answer the question about your study of, of ethnomusicology and music in Mongolia. What, just give us a nut, in a nutshell. I, yeah. I just want to know what 23-year-old Sean Hinton was doing uh, were you playing a Tuvan nose flute there? What what was happening when, <laughs> so, in your so studies? I, yeah, so I, I I had a flute teacher, as it happens, not a nose flute teacher. Thank you very much. And the Tuvans uh, uh, do biphonic singing. Actually, they they make two sounds with their throat, so they're quite extraordinary. But um, and they're not Mongolians. They they but they're close. I uh, studied the flute while I was there, and I made recordings of a whole range of of uh, of extraordinary traditional musicians and I went back to Cambridge in fact I wasn't going to go back to Cambridge um, that following year because it was difficult and it was expensive and I actually thought maybe you know it'd be better if I tried to get back to Mongolia um, but the House of Justice wrote my parents and said you know Sean has to keep his word Sean said he was going to go to Mongolia that was the basis so it said he was going to go to Cambridge that was the basis on which he went to Mongolia so we we expect him to honor there's, his there's, to be good to his there's word. There's that truthfulness and thing again. Truthfulness thing. They got me on the truthfulness. <laughs> Darn it! And so, so you were playing I, flute. I went back. What else were you studying specifically? So I, I studied the flute. I learned the language. That first year, I learned the language. I went back to Cambridge, uh, and I wrote a dissertation um, about Mongolian music, and particularly about one type of beautiful song called a long song. Maybe we'll we'll get one that we can play. And I wrote about that form, about that type of music, about how it was used. And, um, and then in, in an attempt to go back to Mongolia, I registered for my PhD. And then things mm. were opening up in Mongolia. So I said, you know what, instead of going to the city and studying the flute, 
I want to go to the far west, to the most remote, to the mountains of the Altai in the far west of Mongolia and live with a family of nomads uh, in a felt tent um, and live with them and, and see how they use the music. And so the sort of study that I was undertaking was an observational one to understand how music is used in society. And so I did. I had the extraordinary privilege of spending nearly two years of my time in Mongolia, of the seven years I lived in Mongolia. Nearly two of those were spent in the western mountains of, of Mongolia, uh, oh living goodness. with um, with, a, with a family of nomads and uh, in a, in a now, felt I tent. Remember, I remember an incredible story that you told about feeling disconsolate and feeling down and turning on the radio in a remote <laughs> yurt. Can you tell us that story real quick? <sighs> Sure. Well, that was the, the that was that period where I was living um, in the west of Mongolia. Um, I was uh, boy took about a took about a beard. Uh, this was a very remote part of the country, a three hour flight from the capital city to a provincial capital, and then another one hour flight on a biplane. In those days, they used to have these literally these little canvas and wire wood biplanes, Antonov two, that they would fly over the highest pass in Mongolia over the over the mountains land in a dirt field in the in the far southwest of the Mongolia uh, of Mongolia not far from the Chinese border and and then we would take horses and go up into the hills uh, away and it was a long 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 way up to the to the area where I joined this this family of nomads and where I was living so I was about as remote as you can get and and there was no running water um, and I would come back to the city every two or three months to have a shower and uh, speak English <laughs> and eat something that wasn't, uh, uh, you know, didn't have hooves uh, because there was not a lot of anything else out there. It was, it was pretty remote and, uh, and wild in those days, but it was an extraordinary experience. And so I was living out there and, and with them uh, packing up our, our felt tent and, and on the back of the camel and moving to a new pasture every uh, during the summer months, every you know three weeks or so, to get new grass for the animals, and it was in one of those uh, camps in the middle of summer, but so high in the mountains that it had poured with snow that night, and I I was living in a in a little tiny uh, um, sort of bachelor yurt uh, or gare as the <laughs> Mongolians call it, um, next to this other family. And according to Mongolian hospitality, anybody who wants to enter your tent is welcome. You can't have, you know, you can't have sort of much privacy in a, in a civilization like that where people are living so close to nature and in such extreme conditions. So when the, when the lads in the valley wanted to come see the English boy, they would just barrel in on their horses, tanked up on milk vodka, and come visit. And sure enough, one morning... After I had been up milking the goats at 6 a.m., they <laughs> came for a visit and I had no choice but to welcome them. And by the way, as the both the the the, the sort of as the host of the of the gear of the of the tent, I had to make them tea according to Mongolian tradition. So there I was covered in snow in my tent, making them tea trying to sort of distract them while they started opening my bags and looking at my things and, you know, just generally being curious about me <laughs> as a kind of complete oddity in the middle of the mountains. And uh, they picked up this shortwave radio that I had um, in those days and, uh, and they started fiddling with it. And, you know, they were winding it around, you know, all those squiggly noises. And then, and, and then, then they got a little signal from... Um, Radio Kazakhstan or something like that because we were quite near the China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Russia border, you know, all that sort of okay. area. And they got a signal from, I don't know what it was, Radio Kazakhstan. Was like, oh, that was some music. They were like, oh, yeah. Was, they were loving the music and they gave me a little moment. I wasn't feeling very spiritual right now, Ray. I mean, yeah, I can tell you. It's, whew, you know, I needed uh, all the divine assistance I could get right then. I was not feeling very friendly. And, you know, they were, and suddenly they lost the signal and they said, no, fix it, fix it. And they gave it to me. And so I, I started trying to tune in back into the signal. And as I did that, I suddenly stumbled on this clear channel and I heard this English voice, this voice that I rec recognized. 
speaking the words of a prayer over the radio. And 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 they grabbed the radio. Come on, give it, give it the of radio, a Kazakhstan. Prayer. And I was like, of a Baha'i prayer. And I said, get no, just give it to me, you know. And I and I listened, and there it was, clear as a bell, this prayer of Abdul Baha being read in this crystal cut, you know, crystal glass English tones by uh, uh, by a very dear Baha'i friend of mine who, and I recognized the voice instantly and it finished. That was a prayer by Abdul Baha on BBC. You know, this is a BBC prayer for the week or something like that. And I had just stumbled on this, this, this moment on, I guess, the BBC World Service that was being broadcast on shortwave and it was a Baha'i prayer and it was the prayer of the week and there it was. Amazing. And I was just transfixed. There I was in the middle of all of this, dealing with everything, not being, and they're not feeling spiritual, needing some sort of help from somewhere. And I, I came on this extraordinary, you know, a few seconds of this Baha'i prayer from a voice I, I recognized in the other side of the world. And it was a, a just a very personal but very special moment of, of mm. confirmation. And there were those moments when you're, when, and I think you've, you've experienced these. There are moments in one's life, moments in one's career where you, you feel far away from all things spiritual and, and sort of, and then there's just a, something happens. Something happens that reminds us and connects us and, and we remember. And that, that mm. was a, very special when that happens. That's beautiful. Now I'm going to test your Mongolian. Translate yes, the sir. following sentence. Oh my God, you cannot be serious. Help no, I me. don't want to do this. Help me, there's a goat a in the I... kitchen. Nigyama. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. That would probably be right. <laughs> that sounds about right. Oh, I so, think so. Um, Sean, this has been such a wonderful uh, story. Thank you for the long version. And uh, we'll do a part two with you where we get to oh hear more days. about your, your life and your current work and your travails and your family. Um, want to talk about your, your dear father. Um, but looking back on it now, uh, what do you take away from that time and from that experience? What would you want to share with a, a, a listener who's wowed by this story but wants to apply it to their own lives as a schlubby Baha'i. Yeah. You know, I take away, I mean the thing that I that I I I I reflect on more than anything else is how extraordinary the possibilities are that we have in our lives and that confront us so far beyond anything that we can imagine, that we could sort of figure out for ourselves. If I had sat down and said, what I really want to do is go from studying music to Mongolia, and then from there I want to do this and I want to get that job. And I went, no, there was just, there's no way, it was so far beyond what I could have come up with that my, you know, the gift that I've had is being open to these opportunities that 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 were there in my life that were presented that were doors that I was able to go through hmm. that I couldn't have planned for. And I, I guess that that's not to say that we shouldn't plan, that's not to say that we shouldn't work, that we shouldn't have goals and work towards them. But I do think that at every point in my life when I have prioritized service to humanity, when I've prioritized service to my faith, when I have prioritized something else other than my plan for myself, mm. my career, mm. good things have happened. And I, I don't know how to say it any simpler than that. And I don't, you know, it's, it just, when I look back on it, that's the way it's always worked. When I'm trying to game the system, when I'm trying to sort of be clever, when I'm trying to do the right thing for me, you know, sometimes things do, sometimes things don't. I, I have been very lucky in my life and I'm, I'm deeply, you know, grateful for all the things and opportunities that I've had that so many others don't have. And, I, and I, I'm very conscious of that. But the great things that have happened have always been things that I could never have planned. They've been things that have happened when I've prioritized others or service or something. And so if there's any sort of law of the universe that I've taken away from it, it's that, you know, 
being of service is the thing that that attracts the opportunities and makes those uh, things that you can't dream of possible. Uh, mm-hmm. And I just try to remind myself of that at every stage because, like everyone else, I forget it all the time too. And I'm I'm out there forgetting it right now, forgetting that today, you know, and and it need to keep me, remembering uh, it. Uh, a friend of mine who's not a Baha'i he says. Uh, and it's always stuck with me. He said, the most powerful prayer is simply, thy will, not mine, be done. Mm. And uh, that seems to go hand in hand with what you're talking about. And what what have we learned? You know, we are recording this now, you know, during, in the middle of this, this extraordinary coronavirus uh, pandemic. And what have we, what have we learned? We've seen people whose jobs we took for granted and yet who are doing them in a way that is an extraordinary act of service to, 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 to humanity. People who are doing ordinary day-to-day jobs that we took for granted are living the reality of this idea that work performed in the spirit of service is worship. Hmm. And to me, it's that spirit of service. If we bring that to our work, if we bring that to our lives, if we realize that we are only as valuable and only as good as as the good we bring to the world, as the good we bring to others, hmm. then that that elevates what we do from the mundane to a, an act of worship. And I think, you know, we see people valiantly you know at checkouts and valiantly and in hospitals and driving deliveries and you know here in england we've been coming out in the streets in the evenings to applaud those 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 people who are doing you know have got a new title they're now called key workers you know um Mm. but but what they're doing is a form of it's it's a form of worship abdul baha says it's the highest form of worship work Mm. performed in the spirit of service and so for me it's that that how to get that orientation to service in 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 my life every day well sean hinton this has been such a profound pleasure uh it's a, truly one of the great baha'i stories of all time uh someday you must do a book about it about your adventures and your experiences um but this is part one because we still don't know who you are or what you're about or what you do um other than this couple of year uh journey of yours so please come back on the show we're going to do sean hinton part two, and hear the rest of the goodies. Can't wait. Thank you, Rain. It was a great pleasure. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.